Welcome to episode two of season two of For the Purpose of, the podcast about trends, big ideas, and exciting news in the world of ed tech. My name is Keith Tramper, and I'm joined by Ron Hutman, ed tech consultant at Ken Eisty. Sarah Wood, also one of those. And today we are joined by our special guest. We have Jason O'Callahan, a K6 instructional technology specialist from the Granville Public School District. And today we're going to be talking with Jason and the rest of us about the aftermath of COVID-19, the ed tech surge that we may have seen, uh, an amount of technology burnout that we're probably seeing as well. Are we seeing teachers slipping back into the old ways of doing things versus what they may have learned during the emergency remote teaching process that they got thrown into? Um, see if anything new will stay and what's it look like and feel like to be in the classroom today. All right, to kind of kick us off and get us going with conversation today, I have a little question for everyone here. What do you think is the killer app that is missing from educational technology and why? And I'm going to let Ron go first. Yeah. So I think, you know, I've, I've heard this for um, probably going on 25 years, and I think it's been even further than that, but systems that can customize learning content based on students' interest. So as an example, if I'm a kid that really likes basketball, um, wouldn't it be really cool if as I'm learning, let's say math, that because I love basketball so much that the math content that I'm learning actually has some applicability to that sport? or the football, for example, there's a, there's a lot of things I can think of that way. Um, if we're tapping into the student interest, it's been a promise for a long time, but I've not seen anybody come up with anything really good like that yet. Sarah. So I think going back to the thing that teachers always want more of is time and how can we give teachers time? So I guess if I could design some sort of killer app or something, um, something with like, a like a teacher virtual assistant. I don't even know if that's really what it would be per se, but allow teachers to get back some of their time that might help with um, just maybe even organization, grading, um, helping them like keep their day in order and all those reminders and things that go through their head all the time. So I'm sure whoever can solve the problem of how to give teachers time will be making bank off that. So <laughs> Keith? Yeah, it seems like a great use of artificial intelligence, right? I, and I think we've seen some companies start moving into that space, um, although it's a weird gray area between balancing student and teacher privacy, um, especially in the classroom and security um, with that whole how much data do you give to the AI to make things more efficient for teachers? Uh, but my my app, it's not really an app, but it sort of builds off of what Ron said just having an LMS that seems to play nice with other apps. Um, I think there are some tools out there, I'm thinking of like Clever, that sort of lets you talk between an app and an LMS or um, even a student information system, but they never seem to work really, really well. And I think that's one piece of the market that could really um, benefit. Just make that simple for all of our technicians, our tech directors and for teachers and students along the way. Jason, what do you think? Having some sort of, maybe it's it's the way we use a system that already exists, but um, thinking about the whole help desk system. Um, in my role, I have access to our district help desk um, system, a ticket system, and students can ask, access that, but I would love to see students be able to answer other students' help desk tickets. Um, especially at the high school level where you have students who are those techies. They're super interested in everything to do with technology and they go home and they play with computers and all those things. And to give them the opportunity at the high school level to be able to respond to the other students in the district and help them out, I think would be a, a pretty cool thing to have. Let's merge our ideas together, Jason. So we'll have the time saving and we'll have kids answering tickets and we'll have all the time in the world then. Absolutely. Then teachers just don't have to do anything, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Got a couple of billionaires in the making right here. So Jason, we're we're excited to talk to you a little bit about the topic um, of the day. And 
Just for our listeners, Jason is a K-6 instructional technology specialist out in Granville Public Schools. He's been with us um, in Kent County for quite a while now and has been an active member in our KETS group. That's our ed tech specialist group. And we're excited to talk with him um, and learn a little bit about his perspectives and what's going on in Granville. So Jason, would you take a minute and just kind of introduce yourself, share your background and uh, what motivates you? Absolutely. Thanks for having me here. Um, so I started my teaching journey uh, way back in 2003. I uh, was a substitute teacher for two years as I was searching for a job. It was a much different climate than it is now, right? Now we can't find teachers. Back in 2003, there were too many <laughs> teacher candidates and it, it took quite a while. Um, went through a lot of interviews. Found myself with a teaching job in Granville Public Schools in 2005. And I was a classroom teacher, an elementary classroom teacher there for 14 years. Along the way, I was kind of always had my eye on a, a transition point, something that I could do that would still allow me to be in education, but maybe stepping out of the classroom. Uh, as technology grew and grew and grew, I saw that as an opportunity and something I was interested in. And so I, I was able to um, kind of convince our district to come along with what some of the other districts were doing. And that was having somebody who was designated as a ed tech specialist. Um, we obviously had our tech team that took care of the the software and the and the programming and the IT stuff, um, but we didn't have anybody for the teachers to go to for help on using the, all the technology that we had. So uh, 2019, 2019 uh, is when I became the uh, K6 Instructional Technology Specialist in Granville, and it was an interesting year, to say the least. Some of you might remember back in 2019, 2020, when things got a little disrupted with uh, COVID. So that was my first year on the job and it was uh, quite an interesting learning curve that I was able to navigate through. And so I've been doing uh, this ed tech things for, four, this is my fourth year now. What motivates me is knowing how valuable technology is for students and for student learning. Um, and then also understanding what it's like to be a classroom teacher and trying to keep up with everything that you know is good for student learning. And so trying to bridge that gap for those teachers so that they can utilize technology to its fullest, um, but also can still find that way to engage their students in meaningful ways. So I think that's kind of what motivates me and, and gets me excited about doing this work. So Jason, one of the things I think about a lot of times is uh, this need of education technologists within schools. You know, we've had some schools that have valued it greatly or valued the position greatly. We have a lot of other schools that have not really seen that where there is no single point of contact for education technology, integration, implementation, all those things that we, you and I and Keith and Sarah know are very important. Why do you think some schools see the value in it and other ones really don't? Uh, I think, unfortunately, more times than not, it comes down to financial, financial decisions, right? Um, districts have a hard time paying a teacher to do this work um, without having them be responsible for a classroom of students. You know, I know we have interactions with people who uh, are part time, you know, uh, ed tech people and part time classroom people. And so I, I'm not so sure it's, it's, it's a situation where districts don't think it's important or they don't find value in it. I think they have constraints on budgets and they decide to use their money elsewhere. Um, and so they leave it up to the teachers to just kind of help themselves in a lot of ways. Right. Yeah. Well, we see education, you know, in education, the technology is kind of a, I always call it a force multiplier, right? It allows us to do a lot more stuff with less. To me, it always seems like if we've got educators that can use technology to you want to call it replicate themselves, duplicate themselves, do work that uh, is easily replicatable by technology, why we wouldn't do that. To me, it seems like a money saver. But on the other hand, I absolutely understand uh, it's very hard if I'm a district administrator to quantify the value of that person um, because I think it's an absence a lot of times of context. You know, when we've got the context I just laid out as a 
technology as an amplifier of great teaching, it seems to me, you know, if they could look further down the road, they would probably see that. What do you think about that? I, I agree with that sentiment that um, it, it could be uh, an equalizer of sorts, you know, the, the use of the technology, saving time and, and funds. But I also think we need to reframe the position a little bit. I think too often ed tech specialists are still thought of as IT people because most of us have some knowledge about being able to solve some of those problems and work out some of those bugs. But I think the move towards talking about it being a coaching position is a path forward for districts to kind of find that reason or to justify having those positions because we, you know, there's a, there's a secondary ed tech specialist in Granville also. So we work together a lot and we're constantly trying to remind our district and our teachers that we're here to work alongside you. You know, we'll come into your classroom and co-teach. We'll come do a lesson. Um, that's why we're certified teachers in this position. We didn't go to school to be, you know, an IT person and then find ourselves in a, in a school district. So there's some value there. I think you see pretty often that there's a a teacher or two or maybe a handful in each building that have that background, right? That can kind of do some troubleshooting or are kind of leaned on as what I call the ed tech heroes, right? So anytime somebody in the building has an issue, they run to that person. And I think that's where a lot of us get our starts um, in the ed tech coaching realm, right? So going back to your question about what sometimes holds districts back. I think sometimes the people are already in place and, you know, status quo is sort of getting by as it is. So it would be great to see some of those folks, the ed tech heroes, maybe have a little more space to do the instructional tech specialist role or coach role. We'll be right back after this quick break. As educators, many of us were taught the traditional method of delivering instruction. Start with a lesson plan for a specific standard or objective, deliver a lecture to share the new concept, gradually release responsibility, assess, and then do it again. We know this works in theory, but in practice, it's not meeting the needs of all of our students, and it's leaving us frustrated. But don't worry, we get it, and we're here to help. With student-centered learning across Michigan, we're using practical, research-based strategies like blended learning, self-paced structures, and mastery-based grading to meet our students' needs while making it manageable for us. REMSI has partnered with the Modern Classrooms Project to bring you a free, innovative, professional learning experience where you'll collaborate with other phenomenal educators and get support from REMSI instructional tech specialists as you begin to build your modern classroom. And if you're in Kent County, you can get additional support from us. We believe that you can build a classroom that meets the needs of every student every day. Join us. Learn more at bit.ly slash remcslam. That's bit.ly slash remcslam. Are you someone who attends the annual McCall conference in March? Did you know that McCall is so much more than their annual conference and actually offers many learning opportunities throughout the year? And you may be wondering also what this might mean to you as an educator working in Kent County. And it actually means a lot. Through the power of creativity and a book, or possibly two or three. Now is the perfect time to register for the latest PL in a Box learning experience, Unboxing Creativity. This three-part book study will focus on three of Austin Kleon's books. Spoiler alert, he is the keynote speaker for the McCall 23 conference, and you will be able to walk away with a new creative lens to look at your teaching and student learning through. This learning opportunity is free for Kent County educators and only $10 for out of county educators. Spots are limited, so reserve your spot today. And now back to the show. So just thinking, Jason, about um, what we just talked about with, you know, the value of the education technologist within a local district, we kind of wonder in the aftermath of COVID, um, what have you seen with regard to continuous education technology usage? Um, have you seen it 
de- like technology that you're seeing being used a lot more, a lot less? Are people kind of going back to the old ways of you know dead trees and pencils? Um, what are you seeing right now? It, it's a mixture of, of the things you just mentioned, really. There definitely was this great surge in Granville. We, we were one-to-one for about five years before COVID. So we had already kind of made that journey to have everyone have a device, but a lot of the classrooms are still just using them as a byproduct. You know, it'd be, you're done with the work I've given you. So now here's this device that you can go do something else on, you know, play or what have you. And so during the pandemic, there was a little, a, a huge learning curve for a large number of our teachers and our students for that matter. You know, they, they went home and it wasn't like they were in front of us to be like, okay, you know, when, when we're online or when we're doing this remotely, you need to do X, Y, Z because they were already gone. And so that, that posed a challenge for our teachers and our students, but we, we were resilient. I mean, I, I can't say enough about what Granville was able to do during COVID in terms of the, the systems we put in place, um, the training we were able to provide for teachers, um, the learning that students were able to continue having access to. That being said, <laughs> once we get back in the classroom, some of that stuff fell, fell by the wayside. And it was back to our normal, hey, you're in front of me and I have this curriculum that I've done for 10, 15 years, so I'm going to just jump back into it and I'll use this and I'll use that from what what I learned during COVID, but I'm not going to use it all. You know, you always have a certain percentage of your teachers that are go-getters and they want to keep using it because they found the value in it and they loved it. And you always have that certain percentage of teachers who are just like, I, I can't do it anymore. You know, I did it for a year and a half and I'm done with it. I'm going back to paper pencil or I'm going back to having it be part of a center in the corner of the room that, you know, the students hit as they're working through other items and other centers. So it's been an interesting transition. And, um, you know, I found an article that I thought shed a lot of light on nationwide kind of what's happened because of COVID. So I'd like to, to spout off a few of these statistics because I, I found them fascinating. Yeah, please do. This article is from uh, Exploding Topics uh, blog. Um, they do a lot of technology blogs, um, ed tech and just uh, general tech tech stuff. But they compiled a bunch of statistics from a vast uh, group of other tech and ed tech uh, resources. They that they like, for example, Ed Week, right? Ed Week does all kinds of surveys and things of that nature. So this blog put a bunch of those data points all in one article. So one, the, the, a couple that jumped right off to me were that the ed tech market is worth $254 billion, not the tech market, the ed tech market. And uh, one of the researchers suggested that the market could reach $605 billion in value by 2027. So that just stood out to me to say this stuff's not going away. People have jumped on board. People recognize the need and, you know, where there's money, there's going to be businesses and companies trying to get get their piece. The K-12 game-based learning market is expected to grow 20% per year through 2025. That's one thing that I see all the time is this game-based learning is growing and growing and growing. You know, you have esports, you have learning-based games that companies are putting out that actually teach you something. They're not those old school ones that they say, okay, yeah, you can learn something while you're doing this, but really it's still just a, a game. It's, it's just amazing the stuff that's happening. And then uh, talking about, you know, what I'm seeing with my teachers in my district nationwide, 87% of K-12 educators say their tech skills improved during the pandemic. So there's that surge of energy and information and let's get on board and let's use these things. But you come down on some of these stats in this blog and it starts to paint a little bit of a different picture about where we are now and what's happening. Another Ed Week fact says that 87% of K-12 teachers spent more time troubleshooting technology during COVID closures. So they are suggesting that they were spending more time troubleshooting all the technology than they used to do, which of course, where does that time come from? That time comes from teaching 
and helping kids learn and connecting. And so I can start to see how some of this fatigue has set in that I've seen and how, how some of our teachers are deciding, nope, I'm done, you know, and uh, nationwide, three out of five K-12 teachers plan on continuing to give online assessments after the pandemic. I mean, three out of five sounds pretty good, but really, why isn't it five out of five? What did we do? You know, why did we lose those two people out of, you know, the two out of five? What, what can we do to get them back? So those are just some things that like extrapolate on what I'm seeing here in Granville, where we definitely still use some of the things that we learned to use. There were some things that our teachers love and that they want to continue using. There are teachers who continually look for new, new things and ask me about new things and say, hey, can we try this? Can we try that? But there's also definitely a number of teachers that have decided pandemic's over technology goes back in the closet, I'm done. You can totally see that. The, those data points are sort of highlighting that it feels like every teacher built up some foundation of ed tech skills, whether that was troubleshooting or actually instructing with it. But I wonder how solid that foundation truly is. Like, can we continue to build learning experiences on top of the foundation that was there? Or was it built really more as a temporary, temporary foundation that was just in response to a pandemic and emergency? And, you know, I totally get the burnout, but I wonder where the conversation is of what sticks, what needs to stay, um, because we tested it and we now know how it impacts learning and hopefully it was for the better and, and what has to go. You know, there are some parts of that foundation that maybe don't need to be there because we're not in an emergency anymore. Yeah. And I, I kind of wonder too, just about the lifespan of our teachers, right? When I think about lifespan, I just think about the teaching, you know, where many of them are, you know, we saw a significant amount of folks that are retiring. We're seeing a lot of newer teachers coming into the workplace. And I wonder what pandemic experiences they may bring with them from their college experience and maybe, you know, their substitute teaching experience that they may have been guest teaching um, and bring that into the classroom. I wonder if that'll just change over time, you know, based on that experience that folks had and their different expectations. I, I say this a lot because it, it, some people didn't really notice like overtly, but I did for some reason. <laughs> I just think about restaurants, right? So when the pandemic happened, all of a sudden, all these restaurants figured out in a matter of months how to let people order food online and and pick it up at the door or drop it off on the, you know, on the trunk of your car or something like that. And we didn't really do that in education yet. You know, <laughs> how, how can we adopt that? I, I want to call it frictionless delivery of resources. Right. I mean, to me, food's a resource. If I don't have it, I'm going to die. Uh, learning is one of those two. I just kind of wonder, you know, when we might see that happen in our schools. To speak to kind of what both of you are getting at there, I, I find that oftentimes talking to parents uh, about their child's experience during the pandemic and having to be learning from home, and they kind of confuse the uh, social emotional learning issues that arose, which were clear and vast. I don't think anybody disagrees that there were issues with social emotional learning during the pandemic, but they start to confuse those issues with the use of technology because it was all wrapped up into one experience. And so, you know, I guess that kind of leads to the question I had for you guys. How can building leaders continue to allow for like, the ed tech in their schools to evolve. You know, we saw the, the value of the ed tech industry is just increasing at, at breakneck speeds. How do building leaders continue to allow their, their ed tech to evolve when there might be some pushback from the community saying, no, too much screen time. They already spent a year on the computers. We don't need to have them, you know, look at what it did to their social emotional. How, what can they do to, allow for that evolution to continue? Well, I think one big thing is given that a lot of teachers are feeling that tech burnout and are not wanting to try a lot of new things right now, 
now is a great time to take a step back and not introduce new things, but pause and have that conversation of, okay, we've, we've learned all these things. We've set this foundation. What are the best things that came from that? What are the things that you saw connect with your students in new ways? What saved you time? And just have that conversation before we start to have conversations about what comes next. What's the next thing that needs to come in there um, and, and you know, help the situation? Unfortunately, the way we're set up, going back to your point about financial, you know, the money's here now and it may not be here in the future. So there's also pressure that's going against exactly what I'm saying, but pausing that, pausing to have the conversation and not moving forward until we've sorted out what are the things that really connected with our students and our teachers, I think is really important. Yeah, I would say another thing too is um, what are the incentives, right? What are those things that incentivize a person to do anything? Obviously there's external incentives and there's ones that are forced upon you by what your job position is. So without really great incentives to continue these things, if it be through requirements of one being the teacher, um, your community, your students, you know, until there's something that says one must do something, you're probably not going to get a lot. Uh, most of the adoption that we have of just about anything is either mandated or we find that it makes us and makes our jobs easier, better quality of life increases, you know, those kind of incentives too. So I would wonder, you know, as a building administrator or a school superintendent, what sort of incentives do I have to help our teachers understand that the use of technology will help them and help their students, help their parents in the community? I think that's the first part that we need to get to that first order, you know, driving force that we have. We have lots of research that shows that it's doing I don't know if we have a lot of really great examples that all of our teachers really have a good handle on. And I think you made a point in there too, Jason, that I, I wanted to touch on of parents or community members sitting on the other end of the screen, sitting on the classroom side, if you will, during the pandemic, watching their students interact with teachers through a screen, started started to conflate the two things of technology-based learning with lower SEL. And I, th I think it's important to remember that that loss of connection was there before the technology ever showed up, right? Like we were not, not really in a space where we could connect. And in many ways, the technology allowed us to connect more. It maybe helped with that situation. But uh, yeah, I, I totally get it. I mean, the experience of a parent and a community member is sitting on the other end of that screen going, man, my kid is just suffering. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I feel for him. But it's important to remember that that, you know, that SEL break was there before the technology was. The technology was almost a help in that situation. I feel like it's kind of evolved over time, like just just like technology, like you hold up a pencil and be like, at one point, this was actual technology. <laughs> People are like, no, you know, well, compared to the, uh, you know, stone tablets and whatnot, the pencils have come a long way. Um, where I was that kid where like I'd be hiding under my blankets with a flashlight, you know, reading until whatever. And, you know, parents probably getting frustrated that I was tired in the morning or not getting up early. So I feel like we're just um, facing with the, the, I guess, updated version of that book. Like, would you be mad if a student, not a student, if, you know, a child at home was um, hiding under their covers with a Kindle reading? I don't know. What do you think, Jason? Uh, I think that's an important distinction. And, and maybe, you know, us as educators need to be more vocal about that distinction where, it's more about what that screen is presenting than it is about the actual screen. Because, you know, I, I, I fall into that trap too, where I'm like, well, you know, we're watching too much TV and you're on your computer too much. And you're, but is it, is it that there's just a screen on that bothers me or bothers families or communities? Or is it the fact that what is on the screen is not challenging their brain? 
Could it be maybe you're with your kiddo, you know, on a PS three or four or five or whatever it is, building transit routes and city skylines and dealing with budgets and, you know, all that sort of stuff? Or is it just watching 10 hours of Beavis and Butthead? Man, building transit systems is what keeps me up at night, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Beavis and Butthead has its place, too. So yeah. I mean, let's, let's be honest. But no, I think that that's, that's an important distinction because the screen itself isn't necessarily what's causing the, the trouble, if you will, or the problem for, for kids. It's um, what they're doing with that screen. Or is it just mindless TikTok challenges or... You know, as Ron said, are they actually doing something constructive that will teach them some life skills? All right. Well, thank you, Jason. We appreciate you taking some time to be here today. And how can our listeners get a hold of you or get in contact with you if they want to? Um, email really is, is my primary way of keeping in touch with people. So, um, you know, if you go to the Granville Public Schools website, um, you can find me on there and, and shoot me an email. I also do have a Twitter account. It's at J underscore O'Cally, O-C-A-L-L-Y. So you can always uh, shoot me a, a tweet or ask me a question on there and I, uh, I'll, I'll get back as quickly as possible. Um, those, are, those are the two primary ways that uh, I, I usually have people get in touch with me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. And that's it for this episode of For the Purpose Of. We have a special thanks to our guest today, Jason O'Callaghan. And in general, we would love your feedback about our podcast. Email us at edtech at kentisd.org with any suggestions or feedback. To get more information, links to the things we discussed today, and check out our show notes, head over to bit.ly slash imedtech. That's bit.ly slash imedtech. If you like what we're doing here, we'd be grateful if you share this podcast with a friend because sharing is caring. Catch up with you next time on For the Purpose Of. This podcast is Service of Kent ISD. It is produced by Ron Houtman, Sarah Wood, and Keith Tramper. Our theme music is Neon Nights by Scott Holmes Music, and our ad music is Vienna Beat by Blue Dot Sessions. I'm not big on the I'm not big on the socials. Wanna drop your pager number or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My- my beeper number. <laughs> <laughs>